Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike and tech-related questions. Uh, as ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Myself and Alex will do our best to answer as many of them as possible yeah. in the allotted time. <laughs> Where's the time? I don't know. Oh. But uh, without further ado, this week's first question. Right, it's from John Wu. They say, can I leave my bike in the repair stand clamped by the seat post? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, no issue, well, the seat post is the best place to clamp it because that is uh, a part of the bike that is actually designed to be clamped when it's clamped inside the frame of your bike. So it's designed to endure clamping forces and stresses. Don't clamp it on, on the top tube, which no. is a classic mistake people do because they often the wall thickness on the top tube is often very thin. Yeah, it's not designed squished. to be strong in that direction. Well, that was easy for the first question. I wish yeah. they are all like that. Uh, Next question in is from Steve. Steve. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Uh, Steve says, I ride a tubeless setup and got my first known, I like that he said that, <laughs> yeah. puncture from a glass shard while on a ride the other day. I pulled out the glass and spun the tire around and the sealant closed up the hole enough for me to get home. I've added more sealant, added more air and left it for 24 hours to check for leaks. No leaks. My question, should I also put a patch or plug in the hole to reinforce it for continued riding? Is the sealant good enough? I don't think you do need to patch it up. If it's stayed inflated for 24 hours and you've done another ride and you've had no issues, then it means the system's working as it should. If, however, over time you notice that it starts to leak out there a little bit more or you notice some sealants sort are of weeping out of that cut, then in that instance, I would say, yeah, you can take the tire roll off, clean the sealant, and then I would suggest trying to patch the tire up. We had a similar question a few weeks back. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, that would be also what, what I would recommend. Sounds, sounds like a good way to go. I like it. Next question in is from Marco Rossi. Same person that commented a few weeks back. God, we're doubling up, but everyone's getting all their questions answered. So they say, hi, GCN tech team. I'm currently looking to upgrade my Ultegra mechanical shifters to DI2. Brakes are already hydraulic. Should I just buy new levers, derailleurs, cables, and a battery, or is this process going to be much more complicated? Thanks. Um, I think yeah, buying all buying all those parts and installing them isn't too complicated no. to do. Uh, you are obviously going to have to know how to do. The hardest part is going to be doing the brake bleed and, and making sure that your the hydraulic fluid is set up properly. And for that, you will need. Um, a bleed kit and yep. a few sort of specific spanners on that generation of, of Shimano hydraulic yeah. um, levers. We do have videos that can show you exactly how to do that, but rather than investing in all the um, kit to do that, because it's not a job you do hugely often, you could either go down that route or take it to a shop. Um, you work out which is going to be the most cost effective yeah. for you. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I would recommend just buying the parts that you need rather than buying a whole new group set and then doubling up on lots of parts. So yeah. it's probably the most cost-effective way of doing it. And you get to get hands on your bike and learn a bit about it as, you, as you're building it. Yeah, hmm. knowing how to bleed your, your brakes and do and maintain disc brakes is a, is a really good skill to have. Yeah, so. I'm inclined to agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Gary Sum next, who says, Hi gents, I have two bikes. One with uh, Campagnolo Eckhart on it, with a 38 tooth front ring, and the other with SRAM uh, Eagle AXS with a 42 front. I've done gear ratio calculations on their respective cassettes and know that the gear ratios overlap often enough uh, around his ideal cadence. However, one of the bikes still feels slower than the other. The slower feeling bike is 40 grams lighter and has 35 millimeter front tires, 32 on the other. Is accounting for gear ratios not enough to make both bikes feel equally fast? My Strava data indicates that on average I'm slower on uh, the bike and it's not just the feeling. Well, I think partly they've answered their own question in the question. So the two biggest factors when you're riding on a flat road contributing to slowing you down wind resistance and the resistance from your tires. Resistance from your tires. So if you're riding two different bikes, if you've got your body position identical between the two, you can rule out the wind resistance factor. And I think it's your tires which are gonna be making the biggest difference between the two bikes. Now the difference between gear ratios and the minuscule difference in efficiency for them is gonna be so small that I don't think you're ever gonna notice that on your general rides. So yeah. for me, the first thing to do would be get the same tyres on both the bikes. Yeah. Yeah. Tyres is likely to be the, the culprit, I think, here. But then also, we don't know how you're set up on the two bikes in terms of position. I, I totally agree. Yeah, get your position mimicked across both bikes and then start to look at maybe investing in similar tyres 
for both setups. Yeah, yeah. tyres make such a big difference. Um, and 40 grams, nothing. That is absolutely nothing. It's like having a little swig out of your water bottle. Yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, next question is from Nicolas Remiard, who says, hi folks, can a set of high-end aluminium wheels beat an entry-level carbon set? Ooh. My bike shop told me that entry-level carbon wheel set would be around 900 Canadian dollars. What would you consider as the wheel sets of the people? I'm looking for a price range that's worth spending a little more and that will bring more value compared to the entry level. So while I love carbon fiber wheels and both of us will quite often recommend them as a worthy upgrade, I don't think I'd count carbon wheels as the wheel set of the people, would you? No. No, um, but the difference is between aluminium and carbon wheels you start to see the biggest difference when you take into account aerodynamics and weight rather than specifically just the material that's used. Yeah. Now, if, if, if your goal is purely riding uphill, like hill climbing, just going uphill, then weight is the overwhelming characteristic that you, and stiffness that you want to look for on your wheels. Yeah. However, for any other general riding, if you're doing a hilly ride or a mountainous ride, even like a Gran Fondo, overall, even though a deeper carbon wheel might be a bit heavier than a top end aluminium wheel, like the aero more than like pays for that. Yeah. So you're gonna end up having it being faster on the whole, even with a slightly heavier but more aero wheel. Yeah. So for all round use, I'd always go for like the carbon wheel because it can be more aero than the aluminium wheel. Yeah, and I think for me, the difference between the materials is that carbon fiber as a material lends itself into the shapes and sizes that you need for an aerodynamic lightweight wheel. If you had two identical rims, one manufactured from aluminium, one from carbon fiber, the alloy one would be quite a lot heavier, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, so that's why we see carbon fiber using the material choice. Now there's loads of different options around when it comes to your wheels around the thousand dollar pounds or euros marker, but I would probably suggest if you can sort of edge your budget ever so slightly up closer to maybe the 1500 pounds euros or dollars, I think it's gonna open up tons and tons of different options from all sorts of manufacturers and you'll even get to some of the bigger brands. Um, yeah, and yeah. some really good like carbon wheels around that around that price. That yeah. Have, yeah. My sort of advice would just be look for a reputable brand and make sure you're getting good quality hubs and bearings in there as well. Yeah, hmm. and something that's got a, a decent wide rim so that you can you know potentially set it up tubeless or have nice wide tires on there that don't mushroom out that makes a lot of sense i like that yeah. good advice there Ollie. next question is from vince verano they say can you go bike packing on an aero bike this sounds like a question you'd ask um they're going on a bike packing trip next year riding the whole length of their country 2000 kilometers with lots of climbing and they get a Cervelo s5 this christmas lucky them uh, I know a gravel bike or endurance bike would be best suited for this trip, but I've been saving up for the S5 and I really want it and I've only got the budget for one bike. I would say 100%, absolutely yes, and you probably will still be faster uh, on, on an aero bike, even when it's loaded up with bags and stuff, um, than, than a non-aero bike loaded up with bags. But one thing you absolutely must do is invest in a load of like protective film or tape so yeah. like get some like 3M uh, clear tape that you can put on and wherever you're putting bags on your bike, put that on the frame. Because, especially if it's a new bike. Yeah, because <laughs> the, the bike bags, especially on a 2000 kilometer ride, they will rub away at your frame. They will, they'll scratch the paint, they'll even... If, I think they'll go through it in the worst case. They can go through case, the paint yeah. and through the lacquer and down to the carbon, like we've seen that happen. Um, so on a really nice new bike like a Cervelo S5, yeah, oh, please take precautions to protect it. Um, and yeah, that sort of like nice clear 3M stuff, you can always take it off afterwards when yeah. you finish bike packing to reduce the weight a little bit. But um, yeah, put all that on, protect the frame, protect the seat tube, protect it all. So whilst I do agree with you, yes, it is possible to go bike pack on an aero bike, I'm not sure that either of us would agree it's the most suitable bike for the job, is it? Because you might want something that's perhaps a little bit comfy and gives you a few more options in terms of mounting points and putting your bags on, but it's certainly possible. Yeah, yeah. the nice thing with all the bike packing bags that you get now is you can use pretty much any bike. You don't need one with pannier racks and stuff. Yeah. Right, okay. Next question is from Eddie Ishak. They say, hey guys, love the show. What's your best recommendation for counterweighting long 80 millimeter tubeless valves on deep section aero wheels? 
I feel and can hear the wheel vibrating a bit whilst I'm free wheel, free wheeling, riding a 2022 Trek Madone SLR. Well, I don't feel like there should be any need to counterbalance a modern wheel. You see, when it's manufactured, they should take into account the fact you're going to have to use a long valve, and therefore, in many cases, the wheel is counterweighted at the point of manufacture. Um, I think sometimes you might find that it isn't quite the case. And then in this instance, I've had on some wheels in the past where I would look to try and bond or glue a very small sort of, uh, maybe even a washer or a small little nut on the inside of the rim. To try How much difference it. do you find counterweighting the wheels actually makes? Well, if it's far enough out that you feel you can notice it on the bike, because at high speeds you can almost feel that little bit of a wobble, then I think it's it's worth trying to get right. But if you can't feel it, it's not something you need to worry about. Yeah, I would say the same. Okay, well, there you go. Um, next question, and this is the last question. It's from Jason Fenech, who says, hello guys, now that winter is coming and we're going to use our turbo trainers more often, does our turbo trainer need any servicing? Oh, um, no. I'd say jet wash it. <laughs> just jet wash it down. Oh, please do not jet wash your turbo trainer. There's a lot of uh, brands that be very While angry it's plugged in. Mm. Mm. Yeah, don't do that. My um, advice would be not take Ollie's advice on this situation. <laughs> I don't think you need to do anything to your indoor trainer. It's a product which is generally used indoors, it's generally clean, generally dry. The um, one thing I would say is like if your cassette on your indoor trainer is a bit grubby and it's been on there a year yeah. and maybe you've not like cleaned it much, yeah, like use the standard cassette removal tool tools that you'd use on your bike. Take the cassette off if it's a direct drive tur turbo trainer. Yeah. And give your cassette a clean. Dry it, reinstall it. That's basically all you have to do. Yeah, it's all like a sealed contained unit. There should be nothing to do. There will, however, occasionally be times when something goes wrong on an indoor trainer, and that is the beauty of buying from a reputable brand or from your local bike shop. If you have a problem, you can take it back. Yeah, so there is actually, you, you, now people have had turbo trainers a good few years. I have had a few instances where I've heard people say that the bearings have gone in their indoor trainer on like the free hub yeah. um, and things like that. So these things can happen, but like I say, because it's not getting washed, it's, it, it's, it's, it's out inside clean, the bearings are lasting a huge amount of time. Yeah. That said, yeah, it, it, when your bearings do go, you'll kind of know. Yeah. And, and they are, in many instances, replaceable, especially from big brands like Wahoo. Yeah, cool. Right, that's it for this week's GCN Technic. I hope we've answered everyone's questions. As always, if we didn't get to yours, keep commenting it in the comment section down below. Be persistent, because one week we'll get there. Right, gonna go. See you later. Bye.